Hello and welcome to the Resilient Life Podcast. Resilient Life is part of peakprosperity.com. It's where we focus on practical and actionable knowledge for building a better future. I'm your host, Adam Taggart, and today's guest is Toby Hemingway. Toby is one of the country's foremost experts in the field of permaculture. He's an accomplished writer and instructor on the topic, and is author of the award-winning book, Gaia's Garden, A Guide to Homescale Permaculture. It's the best-selling book on permaculture ever. And while the word permaculture is mentioned often here on peakprosperity.com, most readers admit that they don't actually have a firm grasp on what that word exactly means. What's the underlying theory, and what are the practical applications a backyard gardener should think about putting into practice? Toby's graciously joined us today to address just these questions. Toby, welcome. Thank you, Adam. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. Well, why don't we start at the beginning? What exactly does the word permaculture mean? Right. And that's a very good question. It's, it is hard to define permaculture in a sound bite, but I'll give you the first sound bite and then I'll try to explain it in a little more detail. But one way to think of permaculture is whole systems thinking applied to design. Now that's kind of nebulous and abstract. And so to, to just give you a little more concrete idea, uh, I could give you a little bit of history of just where it came from that there was an ecologist and forester in Australia named Bill Mollison. He's still around, but in the 1950s, he was studying the Tasmanian rainforest, uh, looking at marsupial browsing. And while he was looking at this amazing, lush, productive, beautiful, incredible ecosystem, he had this thought of what would it take for us to be able to design, for humans to be able to design our own environments that had all these properties of resilience and self-healing and self-organization and all the all the great things that ecosystems do so he spent the next 15 years or so really trying to figure out what it is that nature is doing when she creates these sustainable landscapes and in the 1970s he met up with an undergraduate student who got a lot of these ideas down too, named david holmgren and they developed a set of principles uh, they coined the word permaculture as permanent agriculture. They were really looking at, at permanent food systems. But they, the idea behind permaculture is how do we take what nature seems to do so effortlessly in these productive, lush, self-renewing landscapes, how do we apply that to our own landscape design and, and many other things as well? So it's really ecological design of human environments. Hmm. Um, and what are the learnings from that? How how successful can we be as humans in recreating what nature has done? There's The field is definitely still in its infancy, I would say. I mean, we've only been spending 20 or 30 years or so actually trying to, to apply these permaculture principles. But what we've learned is that we can mimic a lot of the functions in ecosystems if we if we go at design from a functional point of view like what processes do we want to have going on here do we want clean water clean air soil building increases in biodiversity if we think in those terms instead of what products do we do we want you know do we want more apples more rice but realizing that the food product productivity needs to be embedded in a larger set of processes and then great food productivity just comes out as a byproduct of all these other processes going on. But it's it's looking at how ecosystems function and trying to mimic those functions. And we're, we're getting fairly good at it now. We still need more work, but there are hundreds of functional permaculture sites. I mean, there are thousands around the world, but there are certainly a few hundred now that are up and running and matured and be going for 20 years or so. And we're getting data and seeing that not only can we create healthy habitats for humans, but we can dovetail those in with healthy habitats for natural systems as well. All right. And I want to get into those principles in just a moment, but uh, I'm curious because you you mentioned great food production as an after effect to a certain extent. Is there a trade off to be uh, permanent or sustainable um, in agriculture versus yield? Or do you actually find that you can get equivalent yield or maybe even greater yield with that sense of permanency? What we're seeing is that that in some cases there's a trade off. Uh, I guess it depends on what part of the system you're looking at. Like overall, I think what permaculture is saying is that our systems, our food producing systems are going to be more extensive rather than intensive. 
that instead of dedicating a piece of land only to producing food, which we may do in some cases, but what, what we're really wanting to do is dedicating pieces of land to serving multiple functions, one of which is food. And in that case, you will get somewhat lower yields in kind of per acre. But overall, what you're going to have is the same amount of food production, yet really great habitat going on at the same time. Instead of having you know, 20,000 acres of soybeans or right. something where there's not a living thing except soybeans, you can have 20,000 acres of incredibly rich prairie food forest ecosystem that's not producing quite as much food, but we're allowing a lot of other processes to go, and go on at the same time. But that's just one way of looking at it. Permaculture certainly can help us design really intensive food producing systems. We just want to balance those with, you know, for every raised bed I've got, I want to have a nice little patch of intact forest somewhere too. Great, great. And I don't want to get ahead of the conversation, but um, one of the questions that I'll, I'll want to get into in a little bit is, as we begin to look at how we produce food as a, as a country, what are the ways in which, what are the benefits that permaculture can offer that can um, perhaps change minds out there that are so used to doing this monocrop, high yield factory farming uh, type of approach? Is there a way in which we can you know, convince those hearts and minds that the permaculture way is a better way to go? But, but before we drill that deeply, because um, you are right, there's a, it's a much broader canvas than just, just food production. Um, why don't we talk about you know, some of the most important of those foundational principles that you mentioned the early pioneers began creating back in the 70s. Um, uh, you know, what, to be considered permaculture, what are, the, what are the key elements that need to be uh, kept in mind? Right. Well, one of the things or several of the things that we've learned from nature is, is what, what we call these permaculture principles. And you can think of them as kind of indicators of sustainability. These are things that we see nature doing over and over again, really consistently in almost any healthy ecosystem. And there are, well, depending on who's writing it, anywhere from 12 to 14 or 15 or so, there are probably more. There, but these are, are principles that we know really seem to be applying to most ecosystems. And they're things like everything in a healthy ecosystem does more than one thing. You know, that nature is marvelous at what we call stacking functions where if you have a conventional landscape designer, they may choose a tree for shade or fruit or you know, a single function. And if you look at what a tree is doing in any natural system, you know, there it's producing fruit, it's producing shade, the leaf litter is building soil, the roots are breaking up heavy soil, it's harvesting rain and channeling it somewhere, it's habitat for a zillion different kinds of creatures. And that's the kind of thinking that that permaculture recommends and so we put it into a principle of every element should serve multiple functions so that's that's one permaculture principle that we see over and over again in natural ecosystems and that's that's one of the 12 or 14 or so that we have and uh, i would imagine that that's probably one of the reasons uh, why monocrop factory farming uh, if you will is is uh as problematic as it can be is because you're basically trying to force sort of a single function. You've, you've got such a, a, a maniacal f uh, focus on, on a single objective that you're trying to achieve that you're, you're basically ignoring the many other functions that need to be in play in that system. Right. And, and if those other functions aren't in play, if they're not being taken care of somehow, they either they're gone, you're missing them, or you have to do them yourself. And that's why conventional agriculture is so resource intensive, intensive right. that in, instead of fertility being a natural part of the cycle or insect pest predation being a natural part of the cycle, we've removed all the other pieces of all these cycles. So we have to do all that work ourselves. We got to refine the fertilizer and bring it in. We have to irrigate. We have to spray to get rid of the pests because they're out of balance. Whereas in a natural ecosystem, so many of those or a more natural designed system, many of those functions will be taken care of by the other elements in the system. So that's part of permaculture design is what are the important functions we need to have present here? And then how can we put in the different pieces that will serve those functions for us? Excellent. So um, getting back to the principles, then there's this one of sort of nature's multitasking agents, if you will, right, where everything serves multiple purposes in this, this complex system. In that system, uh, you've got many different types of players. Um, you've got flora, you've got fauna, uh, you've got uh, you know, large organisms, you've got microbes, etc. 
um, you know, when you when you look at a patch of, of land and you put your permaculture design hat on, um, what are some of the first questions you ask yourself about what potentially to do with that that, that plot of land in terms of, of, of really helping activate you know the, all the different components of the system? Right. Well, we kind of we come at it from two different directions, and one is you know, our our goals. What is it that we need to have happening here? Uh, just based on our skills and, and that sort of thing. But the really larger component is to look at the piece of land and, or this, whatever the system is, and we're talking about landscape, but there are many other things we could be designing, but we'll stick to landscape, to look at it and see what are the major resource flows on the landscape, what are, what are the resources that are available, uh, where are the bottlenecks? So we do what, what we call a sector analysis is one of the first things that, that we start with. And sectors is just a jargony word for what are the major influences affecting this piece of land? In other words, are there sunny patches and shady patches? So the sun would be a sector. You, it's, it's an outside, a sector is just defined as an outside influence that you can't really turn off yourself. Right. Like the sun or like a prevailing winter wind would be another one or say, Fire may come up from a t particular direction. Uh, where are the water flows? But also things like what's the zoning? Is That's another very important mm -hmm. sector. You, you want to take that into account when you're designing something. Or uh, what's the history of the land use? Or what are your neighbors doing that you know, may influence your, your land? So we do a sector analysis first to figure out where are the, what are the major influences? What are the major resources? What are the big flows that we can kind of tap into that are already going on there? What are the sources of energy? So that's really one of the first steps when we, we get to a piece of land is do a resource analysis and looking at the big flows and energies that are, that are there. All right. Um, and let's say you've, you've, nailed in your desired purpose for this land, you know, could be food production, could be habitat, could be whatever, and you've done your assessment there. Um, how, do you, how do you begin to proceed next? Is it, is it a, um, a process of kind of beginning to map form to function, if you will? Yeah, that, that, that would be part of it, that at this point, now you can look at what, what does the land want to do, kind of what, what processes are already wanting to happen there that we can sort of piggyback onto that so that nature's already doing a bunch of the work and then we would use that to help shape our own vision or our own ideas of what and you know, what how our needs can dovetail into this into the land and so at that point we start thinking about okay now that we have a a rough vision and we know what this landscape is already doing then we start thinking about what systems are going to help this happen in other words what are the, the major functions that need to be going on, such as do we need to be generating energy of some sort? What's, what energy is going to drive the processes that we need to go on? Can we run it all off of sunlight? Do we, have, you know, do we need wood or some sort of fiber energy like that? Do we have to import other sources of energy? We would look at what's our water source and where are we going to get that from and where is it going to go? What's going to happen to the waste streams? Uh, and, and kind of we, we go around what we call the permaculture flower is looking at you know, how do we produce food, how do we produce energy, what, how do we deal with water, how do we deal with waste, uh, and so on, looking at the basic needs there. Then we would figure out what systems need to be in place to do that. Like if we have to deal with waste, then okay, given our specific situation, do we want a gray water system? Do we want a black water system? Do we just want a regular old septic system? You know, what, what's the best system to deal with waste given our particular circumstances? So we just kind of go around the permaculture flower that way saying, now that we know what's happening here and what processes want to happen, how can we choose the systems that are going to dovetail into those processes so that they're, they're just inevitable, they're just going to happen because we're not fighting the processes, we're piggybacking onto things that are already happening there. Okay, and um, with permaculture, does it have to be a natural system or in certain cases can you rely for parts of the flower on a more sort of man-made system? So you mentioned septic earlier. Um, uh, to, to get the perma in permaculture, does it, does it have to be natural or does it more just have to be dependable in the long run? 
I, I think it is mostly that it needs to be dependable in the long run, that you can have a fair-sized upfront energy investment to build something as long as the system that you've built is going to yield and pay back that, that energy over time. So, you know, like you bring in heavy equipment to build a pond, and then that pond can last for, well, centuries right. if it's well taken care of. So you paid back that that investment that you put into it. So we're, we're you know, in, permac in permaculture, we don't, we don't have absolutes, like, no, I would never use a bulldozer, or, you know, I'd never use a chainsaw, or something like that. It's, we do the analysis and the assessment, and if there's a good payback from it, particularly now that we still do have abundant fossil fuels, may as well use them for something good that's right. going to going to pay back that investment and to to build renewable regenerative systems out of it so i mean in in a term that's used often on peak prosperity it's energy return per energy invested and you're really just looking for you know, the best investment that will create the highest amount of net energy in the long run exactly which, you know i think chris and i would agree is something that we should be thinking that we should be applying to uh all sorts of different uh, systems out there beyond, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, gardening and landscaping. Yeah, EROI is, is a terrifically powerful tool that, that I think we should be applying in systems everywhere. Well, okay, so um, that's really helpful. So um, uh, once you've, you've uh, well, let, let's, let's maybe bring it home to the average listener who's, um, uh, you know, this line of thinking resonates with them, um, uh, let's say you're uh, designing a, a system for, um, you know, the, the average sort of backyard gardener. Um, what are some of the more common um, best practices, I guess, from a permaculture standpoint that would apply to, you know, a good swath of sort of backyard gardeners? What are what are some systems that they should be thinking about either, you know, looking at uh, on their property to see if they're already functioning well or thinking about putting in if, if they don't have them in now. Right. So another permaculture principle that I think speaks to this is make the least change for the greatest effect. Or in other words, find the leverage points that are going to give you a lot of bang for your buck. Nature's just really good at this, is how can, how can she use a little bit of energy to get a big effect? And if we're looking at the early stages of doing a landscape design or a landscape renovation, one of the biggest leverage points is soil management. That most growing anything is really a question of feeding the soil or preparing good soil. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you have just laid the foundation for terrific growth, for minimal pest problems, for minimal water needs. So, so just as a, a global place to start, kind of the whole process, Getting your soil in good shape is is a really the first thing that that I would think of doing at a site is how can I get cover crops or mulches or whatever the most appropriate technique or techniques there could be a whole series of them to build up the soil because then again we are working with nature that what comes out of that it, it's just going to happen you're just going to get better growth better water retention fewer pest problems, all of that. So that's a global place to start, um, if kind of from a big picture point of view. Sure. Okay, great. Um, and you mentioned a couple of ways to do that um, uh, through mulches, ground cover. Um, I think this is one of those instances where it might make sense to, to actually, you know, maybe leverage a little bit of fossil fuel and, and, and bring in some truckloads of, of high quality soil if you've got really poor soil quality. I know uh, Chris, you know, at the Martinson's house when they uh, first moved in there, they discovered that they basically were living on a big sand deposit. Um, and so they started sort of the lasagna method of, of gardening as they, they built their garden beds where they you know, put down a cardboard and then, then brought in a bunch of, uh, of nice loamy soil on top of that. And it just over the years have built up, you know, uh, a great rich topsoil that probably by natural means might have taken a lot longer to create. Um, uh, any other sort of, you know, low-hanging fruit for someone who's looking to, to build their, their soil quality besides those three things, trucking in, mulching, ground cover crops, or, or anything else about that that people should know? Yeah, I think we want to look at what areas really need intensive management and which ones can we take our time to develop. Because, say, if you have, I mean, even something as, as modest as an acre, 
if if you try and you know like bring in enough mulch or compost or something to build up that entire acre, it's going to be very expensive. That is, that's, that's a lot of know, dirt. And it's, yeah, exactly. And it may not work all that well. So there we think in terms of zones, another permaculture tool for designing things, which is, and all that means is that the things that we use the most frequently or that need our use the most frequently should go the closest to us. And, and so in terms of soil, the way I think of that is, I'm going to have an area pretty near the kitchen door or the back door or wherever I am a lot that's my most intensive food production area. And it's probably not going to be that big. You know, if I'm just getting salad greens and a few vegetables and some tomatoes and some herbs and those sorts of things, I don't need a lot of space for that. Right. Therefore, I can afford to bring in the very best primo compost topsoil, you know, a few yards of that, and get that just cranking while I'm applying things like cover cropping or rough mulches, you know, just bringing in arborist tree trimmings or something like that that I've got in bulk over larger areas and building those up a little bit more slowly. So it gives us this graduated system of manage a small area really intensively and, yeah, maybe spend some fossil fuel and some, you know, you might even do a one-time tilling of the whole area or ripping to loosen up the soil once uh, while and that, that helps jumpstart you into better soil management. But you don't have to do the same thing and you don't want to do the same thing over For the whole everything. area. Great point. Just what, what you need to manage the most intensively will probably be a fairly small area and that way you don't get overwhelmed either and you, and you can keep an eye on a small place. Great. And um, just to your point on cover crops, because I'm not sure everybody is, is super familiar with the different options out there, but um, Maybe give the brief definition of what a good cover crop is and maybe an example or two. Of right. Yeah. A cover crop is a crop that you put in for the specific purpose of soil building. So these would be things like uh, nitrogen fixing plants like fava beans or, or types of peas that are really to produce um, more fertility in the soil. Uh, or folks will bring in annual grasses of certain types to grow for a season and the roots will put a lot of organic matter into the soil. The tops of the plants can be used to compost or turn into the soil or just mulch right in place. So a cover crop is a seed that you lay down to increase the organic matter and fertility in the soil. And again, that's just letting nature do the work. You go out and spread the seed and then over the next few months you've got this big boost of fertility in the soil. And then you can come back later and put your fruit trees or garden beds or whatever it is you want to be putting in there. Great. And presumably if you went to your local nursery and said, what type of cover crops grow best in the zone in which I live, that's, that's a good way to get some direction on which cover crops to get. Exactly. A nursery or an extension agent will know exactly what, what the best things for your conditions are. Great. And actually, let's talk about extension agent for a minute because not everybody knows what an extension agent is. Could you briefly let folks know what their role is? Yeah. Every county, a few urban counties don't have this, but but almost every county in the country is part of the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture extension system where there is an agricultural agent or even a whole office in every county um, specifically, you know, the, the agency was created to help the people in that area with whatever their farm or agricultural or food producing needs is. So you have an agricultural extension office and usually a master gardeners group is affiliated with that. Master gardeners are individuals who have learned a lot about gardening through the extension agency. And you can call up the extension agent and usually for free they will be able to answer almost any sort of question. The one caveat about extension agents is that a lot of uh, extension research is funded by multinational chemical corporations. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, not so much as it used to be, but sometimes you will get, you know, what type of pesticide you should be using rather than what kind of organic method. Okay. So just pay attention to that. But it's a terrific resource. Yeah, I would completely agree with that and um, encourage anybody that, that hasn't already reached out to their local extension agent uh, to try to do that the next time they have a question that they're not entirely sure how to answer. Um, all right, so um, getting back to sort of best practices. So we talked about probably the the biggest bang for the buck, which is get your soil to a good place from the get-go. Let's say somebody's, you know, attended to that. What are some other sort of, you know, fairly common best practices or other low-hanging fruit that somebody should consider? And I realize a lot of this is 
you know, specific to the exact type of a property a person has, but, but we're painting with a broad brush here. What are some of the more common ones? Right. And yeah, so we're just looking at the large categories of what these systems are. And another really important one would be water. Uh, like you, maybe you're blessed by in living in an area where it rains really regularly and you never have to irrigate. And But those places are, are becoming harder to find. Right. Well, and you and I probably won't see water now for another seven months. Not enough. here in Northern California, probably not, or maybe once in the next, next six or seven months. So there, again, by building up soil, you've helped the water retention properties in the soil, but also putting in water harvesting. Um, figuring out where the water is moving on your land. Uh, and everybody has uh, an automatic water harvesting device called your house, where the <laughs> roof will catch water and you can put it in tanks. Um, you can also contour the soil to hold water better, just to prevent runoff or whatever rains do occur, get the water to soak into the soil and stay there. Is so, that when people talk about swales? Is that really the use of a swale? Right. A swale is a, is a permaculture word, a word that's been kind of co-opted by permaculture to mean um, a, a ditch uh, can be fairly shallow. It's essentially, think of it as a long skinny pond, about a foot or two feet wide and however long you want to make it that runs right level on a contour line. Um, they're usually put on a slope. Uh, so obviously they're running across the slope. So when water runs down the slope during a heavy rain, it hits the swale, drops into it, spreads out, doesn't run any further, and then sinks down into the soil. And these are amazing devices that really increase the water holding capacity of your soil. Even in places that are quite dry, you can really find that after every rain, a huge amount of water has been put down into your soil. So it's something that that have been they've been in use for well really thousands of years but but permaculturists have really developed swale technology to kind of a fine art over the last couple of decades wow okay so there's there's cashment and things like rain barrels that you you know put underneath your gutters there's things like swales i know we've had uh, joel salatin on in the past he's a big fan of what he calls farm ponds but basically um uh, you know, i guess there used to be in the old days a huge system across the country of these small little farm ponds uh, that have largely been removed, that he says that's probably one of the, the absolute best things we could do for our nation would, would be to try to get these things uh, back and reactivated. Um, I'm seeing you nodding here, but right. you yes. agree. Yeah, yeah. That they, There have been a lot of studies done showing that a, a large pond, I'll say a, a dam, a great big you know, federally constructed dam, uh, is a much less efficient way to collect a given volume of water that between sediment buildup and evaporation that it's much better to have that same volume of water distributed in 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 small farm ponds than it is to have it in a giant reservoir somewhere. That for one thing, you're hydrating the whole landscape. I mean, picture a landscape that has hundreds of small ponds across it, mm -hmm. and these are earthen ponds. They're not usually lined. I mean, you can build a little garden pond with a rubber liner in it, but these are earth, earthen ponds where the water in the pond is slowly percolating into the soil. And if you've got hundreds of these across the landscape, all that water is draining through the soil, percolating through it, really hydrating the entire area. Um, as well as you being able to individually use the water in your pond. Right. I, I don't know if this is a, a question better put to a meteorologist or a climatologist, but, but would a network of farm ponds like that in a concentrated area actually influence the atmospheric moisture and, and promote rainfall? I think not, not so much from the evaporation from the ponds, but from their ability to keep the soil hydrated. And what you're going to do then is, is naturally increase the tree growth. And for, for one thing, trees need a fair amount of water. And if you now have a large landscape that, that is well hydrated, you're going to get vast numbers of trees, which will evapotranspire. And then downwind from that, you're going to see more rainfall. We know that rain follows trees. And by collecting the water in ponds, you're going to generate a lot more vegetation that are going to green an area. So I'm sure that they're, and they've demonstrated this. They've demonstrated the opposite, at least. You cut down the trees and rainfall drops. Right. So I think we could say that if we increase trees, rainfall will increase. All right. Well, maybe uh, maybe our folks in our home state of California may take note of this, uh, given that uh, the wildfires have already started this year. Uh, maybe a few more farm ponds would be a good idea. Right. Um, last question on, on ponds. Um, you Is there a... Is there a property size uh, below which uh, 
a pond uh, of any dimension doesn't make sense, or or is there no property too small for even a small pond? Or what, what, when does it make sense to consider putting one in? Right. I think the only time it doesn't make sense to have a pond is is when you're in a terrifically dry area without shade, because then it's just going to evaporate, evaporate really quickly. Away. Yeah. But uh, uh, ponds can be put in at any scale. I mean, I've I put in a pond that holds about three gallons of water, just as a little water feature somewhere, and the frogs move in, and the dragonflies move in, and just by having a little bit of open water in the landscape, you're increasing biodiversity, and, and it's pretty, we love the way they look, uh, so they, they have benefits at whatever scale you're at. And again, that's another permaculture design principle, is we're thinking about scale. We're not just, you know, a pond means something bigger than an acre, or a pond means this. A pond is simply any body of water from the size of practically my boot print up to, you know, Lake Michigan. Okay. Well, all right. That's a pretty wide uh, <laughs> wide category there. Um, all right. So we've talked about soil. We've talked about water. Um, let's let's touch, just touch on biomass for a moment. Is, is there, um, you know, something about uh, uh, what can be planted there or, or raised there in terms of uh, fauna um, that, uh, you know, is, is a fairly common practice with uh, uh, taking a property and making it more of a study in permaculture. One of the things that we we focus on in permaculture is we're trying to develop more perennially based systems because mature ecosystems tend to have a lot more perennial plants than annual plants in them and once you start shifting over to perennials you start accumulating biomass or carbon really um, in the landscape. So once you get trees or well, anything with kind of woody tissues in it, if there's enough rainfall to support the growth of that or if you're irrigating, um, then you start building up lots and lots of biomass and there are just tons of, there's so many benefits from biomass. Um, it's, it's stored solar energy. You know, wood is, is mm -hmm. still one of the most used fuels in, on the planet. Uh, so you, you now have a good source of, of fuel wood. Uh, you have a great source of habitat just in having permanent standing biomass uh, and the the general productivity of perennials in, in terms of how much carbon they fix and how much energy they harvest tends to be much higher than, than annuals. Uh, plus you also have when you grow perennials you've got standing biomass all the time but annual agriculture is essentially clear cutting every single year we just go in and clear it back whereas perennial agriculture there's always some sort of ecosystem process happening there all the time. We're not setting it back every year. So there are just there are a million benefits to you know, once you've got the soil and the water or while you're building soil and while you're harvesting water to also set up systems that are going to to increase biomass. And one of the side benefits of that is, oh, and by the way, we're sequestering a huge amount of carbon by doing that. Right, right. Um, excellent. There are so many uh, sort of subcategories of this conversation I'd like to go into and for time uh, we're, we're not going to be able to but I, I really do hope we can have you back on occasionally to, to have a more focused conversation about whether it might be food production, whether it might be um, how to influence or involve the animals that are in the area, um, whether it's on hydration. I mean, there's just sort of a whole long list of things that we could go through. So um, I, I hope we can have you back on for that. But, um, uh, you know, as you describe permaculture and the principles behind it, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, but I, I feel like this could really, this type of logic, this type of rationale, the approach of understanding that everything exists in a complex system and understanding its connection to everything around it, trying to have a um, multifunctional, uh, sustainable, um, and, uh, uh, you know, sort of as, as uh, zero unused waste uh, cycle um, of a design as you can have. I mean, that, that just, that makes sense to me, you know, energetically, it makes sense to me from an economic standpoint, uh, it makes sense from a societal standpoint. It just seems like you could basically scale these principles to so many parts of, of society and the human experience. Um, I, you're seeing you nodding a little bit here, but <laughs> but is this something that, that permaculturalists uh, think about more? I mean, beyond just taking a, a, off the land, but into other elements of society? This is really where permaculture has been going over the last decade or so, is that it really started as permanent agriculture, that we were looking at food systems and looking at how to mimic natural ecosystems. But something that we began to discover was that what we're really talking about is 
complex adaptive systems or dynamic systems or whatever you want to call these these entities that are systems like like an ecosystem but an economy is a dynamic system a community is a dynamic system an energy harvesting system is a dynamic system or the human beings that we, we encounter so many different kinds of dynamic systems and it turns out that if you understand a dynamic system like an ecosystem, if you know the rules for how those can be healthy and how to enhance their health and how to work with them, then you can just you can port those rules over to any other or almost any other dynamic system, like a community or a neighborhood or designing a business or a local economy or an energy system or a social justice system. It turns out that all once you've got these principles, you can apply them to almost any other dynamic system. The main difference is you just need to understand what patterns apply to, say, a justice system or an economic system as opposed to a ecologically designed farm. But the rules turn out to be very similar, so the real the, the fascinating and exciting work in permaculture now is being done in, in social permaculture, in financial permaculture, is, is looking at the human systems, because nature is in pretty good shape by herself. It's the, it's the human pieces right. that we need to get working a lot better. And that's, that's where permaculture is, is, to me, really very exciting right now. It's all the other systems that it applies to. Well, I think that's just fascinating. And, and, uh, and for those listening, I think you're going to, probably see a lot of this thinking begin to really um, increasingly blend into the work that we do here at Peak Prosperity. Um, it, it, it just makes a ton of sense. And as, as Toby said, nature has largely figured out uh, a lot of these problems. And if we can really just uh, follow nature's lead as opposed to try to wrestle it and conform it to you know exactly what we want when we want, um, I, I think we're going to be a lot better off. So um, I, hopefully on, on one of these future return visits of yours, we can maybe delve into some of that as well. That would be great, and I would certainly love to come back, so it would be great. really good. Well, so um, I imagine we probably have a number of listeners here that, um, now that they understand the topic a little bit better, are even more interested in learning more about it. Um, what would your guidance be to somebody who um, you know, would, 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 would like to get a, a, an even deeper exposure into the permaculture mindset? What resources do you like? Right. Well, there are permaculture groups in really every major city and a lot of smaller cities and a lot of rural areas. So just looking to see if there is a permaculture meetup group or guild, we often call them permaculture guilds in your area, so that you can get to know other people who are doing this is one easy way. There are a lot of and you do that by either Googling permaculture guild in your city or maybe, you know, reaching out to your local nursery or your extension agent and asking for Right. Those would direction. be a, a good place to start. Perhaps okay. not the extension agent. They may not know this that well, but, okay. um, but yeah, just looking for, you know, Googling permaculture, you know, Minneapolis or wherever you happen to be um, will get you some of the resources there. Uh, there are perm good permaculture courses being offered in, again, pretty much every major city. And there are also a lot of really good permaculture books out there. Um, I it would include mine, but there are there are plenty to look at and getting to be more all the time. Any you feel comfortable mentioning off the top of your head, in addition to your book, is obviously. Yeah, um, <clears throat> one of the foundation texts that when you're really serious about it is a book by Bill Mollison, the co-founder of Permaculture. Uh, called Permaculture, a Designer's Manual. And this is kind of the Bible of permaculture. It's, it's very dense, uh, but it's very complete. So it's not something you're going to read cover to cover, but you might dive in on it. Okay, so maybe not the first book you get, but right. once you really get the bug, it's a good reference to have on hand. Yeah, Bill does have a condensed version of this or a simplified version of this called Introduction to Permaculture, which uh, is, is much easier to read. So that's, a, that's another very good place to start uh, as well. Good. Any websites that you would recommend somebody go check out? There, the largest permaculture forum website uh, is called permies.com. That's P-E-R-M-I-E. Uh, and it's, it's a huge website with a lot of categories in it. It's kind of the peak prosperity of permaculture in a way. Oh, um, in you're that you're very flattering. <laughs> <laughs> in, that, in that there are many different categories and a large number of people visiting. And so you can... You can ask questions, and you could say uh, anybody you know, using permaculture in my area, um, or just whatever question you want answered. So a lot of good web resources like that as well. Great, great. I should also mention too that on peakprosperity.com we have the 
uh, agriculture permaculture group um, so it's a good place to ask questions um, if you've got uh, you know probably more focused questions that the group members can direct you to answers on um, we also have a series um, of articles that are being written in our on resilientlife.com which is the, um, the kind of the practical application uh, part of the Peak Prosperity website. We've got a gentleman there named Phil Williams who has his own permaculture consulting business, and he's been generating a lot of very focused topical content there, how to plant bare root fruit trees, how to create swales, that type of thing. So uh, getting back to books for a moment, though, I understand that in addition to uh, the excellent book you've written, uh, you are, have another book that's coming out in the relatively near future. Is that true? Yeah, I'm just finishing the manuscript of a book on urban permaculture. I'm um, having spent a lot of time in cities and just seeing how we can take what we know about growing permaculture systems and really apply those not just to urban food production, but also social permaculture and economics uh, and community building and those sorts of things. So it it's kind of my synopsis of where permaculture has been going over the last few years uh, and I hope that that will be out sometime within the next year if uh, all the deadlines get met properly but um, just a, my, my book on urban permaculture. Okay. Great, excellent. Well that's a whole other podcast right there and I know that there'll be a lot of interest in that because we have a lot of listeners to these podcasts who do live in urban settings and I think to a certain extent feel limited uh, in what they can do when we talk about a lot of the gardening and agricultural aspects of, of the site. Um, so having some direction on how they can implement permaculture into their own lives while, while being an urban dweller I think will be of great interest. So that's excellent. So um, if, if it's all right with you, we'll have you back on when that, that book has hit the shelves. And in the interim, um, how can people learn a little bit more about you and, and what you're up to? Is there a website or any other place they can go? Yeah, I have a website called patternliteracy.com. Those two words, pattern and literacy, because one of the things we're doing in permaculture is trying to understand larger patterns and how we can become more literate in them. So I post articles there, uh, videos. There, I, I keep my workshops and lectures uh, pretty up to date there, so I, I do travel a lot to teach, so I am in a lot of different places, so I may be coming to a neighborhood near you at some point. Uh, so that's a, a uh, patternliteracy.com is, is where to find out what I'm up to and what I'm thinking about these days. Excellent. Well, Toby, thank you so much for taking the time today to, to meet with me on this. Um, I think you've done a great job in really sort of lifting the veil on what permaculture is so for our listeners and for me. Um, so thank you, and, and I hope we have you uh, back on again soon, and then again later on when your book has, has launched. All right. Thank you, Adam. It's been lots of fun. All right. <laughs>